Well, hello, uh, Professor Barry here. Um, I go by Tom. I mean, really, that's just sort of my name, right? Um, any, anywho, this is a first video. Uh, what is sociology? Just the goal here is to provide you a little bit of background um, about sociology. I do want to share with you um, a document real quick. Let me kind of pull it up here on my computer. For each of these videos, there's a worksheet that goes along with each of these videos. And the idea of the worksheet is just to kind of give you uh, something to just kind of track through the video itself. So this is the one for this particular video, uh, basically a bunch of questions, something to, something to kind of work through, major content of the video, way to get organized. Um, it's also about preparation. It's, it'll be useful for, for your preparation for um, the midterm and the final as well. Um, yeah, so I encourage you to fill that out as you go along um, and bring, you know, drop me a, a, an email with any questions or bring, if you're in a remote-based class, bring those questions forward to class um, and all is good there. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and get started with what is sociology, um, introduction to sociology. So basically, um, Okay, so he has all these different academic disciplines. We have these different areas, right? So we have the natural sciences, uh, we have humanities, uh, we have the social sciences. And the social sciences include things like anthropology, the examination of groups and culture, history, you know, understanding the past, understanding things that are using the past to inform the present, economics, the study of human behavior through a different lens. Um, you know, macro, micro level, you know, both sort of levels economics, but both it's about understanding human behavior and system behavior. Uh, thinking about psychology ranging from the individual all the way to social psychology, the mind and society. So neuropsych to kind of social psych, you know, there's different aspects of psychology. Geography, the influence of place and location on, on, on the development of human communities and society itself. Uh, I mean, all these different kind of things, right? And what, so what is the overall kind of goal? Like, why do, what, do, what do we do with all this kind of information and all these different perspectives? Well, you could have, you know, part of this, I mm -hmm. mean, I give you a couple different examples, but part of the value of, an, of education, whether formal or informal, I mean, people get educated outside of the walls of an educational institution, uh, but, it, you know, an educational institution could provide a vehicle or, or a way of organizing information and a way of developing, you know, information, but it's not the only way to become informed and educated. But anyway, so within things like looking at the uh, union representation in the United States, uh, if we look at the number of individuals who belong to unions, labor union, labor unions, I'm thinking of specifically here, uh, how workers, what, what influence do workers have in terms of working conditions themselves? The United States, we have really low uh, labor union representation compared to other industrialized countries. Well, there's a history behind that. Uh, there's a history behind a lot of that. Uh, there's a story to tell about cultural, our cultural values that puts capital sometimes above people. Profit over people uh, is a long-term project in the United States. Part of our sort of, you know, makes us unique, but also some challenge points with that as well. Understanding something like white nationalism. I mean, after the event in Charlottesville, uh, you know, the, the protests and the counter protests that were going on in Charlottesville, um, the rise of white nationalism in the United States, I think we need to understand anthropo from an anthropological viewpoint, uh, social groups and organization, uh, what's going on in terms of white, white nationalism, white nationalist groups. Uh, there's an anthropological investigation with that. Social psychology, thinking about in-group, out-group, the development of in-group and out-group. What, what, how does um, prejudices and ideas sort of, you know, develop? How do they get facilitated? Uh, how do we overcome some of that stuff? Thinking about even geography plays a role in that um, as well. I don't know that area as well, um, but, but we can use a lot of this stuff to be able to understand events that are going on today. Even thinking about something that seems part of our landscape, but doesn't seem like there's much to it. Something like charter schools um, and looking at uh, charter schools, private schools, you know, questions sociologically thinking, where, when did we start doing this? Um, part, of the, part of the expansion of private schools happened after 1954 in Brown versus Board of Education, US Supreme Court decision that ended 
legal segregation. So we had, you know, the movement was towards desegregating public facilities. Uh, so thinking about education and there were a lot of whites in certain communities that said, you know, we do not want our kids going to an integrated school. And so started to form their own, um, you know, private schools uh, to protect sort of, protect sort of racial, you know, racial exclusion. Um, we could look at a little broader stroke of history and look at, you know, like something like this, the number of years of education that's required um, or, you know, required for the economy for, you know, for achieving economic, more economic freedom. Um, this is a reflection of new technologies, a reflection of development of new industries, a reflection of sort of where we are, have grown as a, as a world, as well as we could look at it within a nation itself. So part of it is understanding all this stuff, basically, to understand the human experience, um, to understand society. Um, you know, we have to understand all these different aspects of the human experience. Sociology, <laughs> excuse me, is very broad. Can be very broad. We have our own. It can be have a very broad focus. We have a lot of. We have three main theories, branches of theories in sociology. But we draw upon in sociology. Draw upon. Um, a lot of different academic disciplines um, to try to inform and understand uh, what's going on in the social world. So we are, you know, a discipline, but a discipline that draws upon a lot of different disciplines or areas of academic thought to uh, better inform. Well, why, why understand human experience? Well, part of it's curiosity, wanting to know, the desire to know, uh, the night sniff around a little bit, trying to un uncover what's going on. Uh, part of it's to understand the present, you know, looking at the past, understand things that are going on today. So part of it's about curiosity. Part of it may be the third bullet point is to become more informed, more aware, more deeply grounded in terms of more objective, more scientific thought in order to be able to identify uh, solutions or remedies for social issues and problems. Um, a lot of social sciences came, their, their expansion came in the 1800s because in part because a lot of expansion and development going on uh, that was going on with urbanization, industrialization, and um, a move away from a sacred social order where religion had a more central focus within community and society to, to the role of secular world, science, technology. Um, so major transformations going on uh, during the 1800s sort of gave rise to the development of social sciences. I put this chart here just to kind of get at, I mean, just look how difficult it can be, well, you know, potentially difficult uh, to create a stable social order. And in some ways it's pretty amazing, regardless of the complexities and challenges and stuff that's going on today, to get organized and try to be stable in an environment that has changed so rapidly and the number of people, it's actually a pretty amazing enterprise. But we also have to be sensitive to and aware that not everybody is experiencing the world in the same way or society in the same way. Issues of, you know, there's a lot of inequities that need to be addressed to make the world work better uh, for more people. But just look at this, right? This is pretty fascinating. So in 1790, the US Census, which didn't include everybody who was residing in North in the United States, the boundaries of the United States of America, so Native Americans, indigenous communities were not part of the US census. I don't believe slaves were part of the census as well. I'd have to go back and look at that in 1790. But, relative, but regardless of that, the population size numerically was fairly low and most of it was in a rural community. Look at this jump and change. In a 30 year time period, there's an 80% growth, almost a doubling of population in the United States in a 30 year time period. And if we could look at the racial demographics of this too, it's a lot of immigration going on um, during that particular time period, a major transformation going on in society and also an increasing a shift going from rural to urban. Um, and that's still, you know, that's going on today, right? Look where we're at today. We're about 300 in 2010, it was 310 million, um, you know, 330, 340 million Americans now. Um, most 20, 80%, 80, 20 from urban to rural. Major transformations, right? Uh, and the more we can understand the dynamics of those transformations, the more that we can understand not only the past, but we can inform us of the present. Um, Lewis and Clark, 1800s, before Lewis and Clark, you know, uh, made their voyage west, there was approximately 50,000 member, you know, indigenous community members uh, living in Oregon country. 
Um, so they, you know, sometimes that's a, a history that some of us forget. Um, that that Oregon did not start with Lewis and Clark. There was a long history of indigenous communities throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, if we look at it from, you know, looking at, okay, let's look at population growth and development from white settlement in 1903, uh, population had been 203 people. Um, 50 years later, basically, um, after the development of mills, the running of the mills, development of industry, moving people here, people moving here for agricultural reasons. Um, and I say people, I mean whites moving here for those particular reasons in those industries. Uh, 22,000 people in 1950. Uh, 1960s, Sun River, uh, there was Camp Abbott, um, a place for training and a transition to Sun River, uh, Sun River as we know it today. Uh, this idea of Bachelor Butte Ski Lodge opens up in the 1960s. Uh, if you go down Skyliner Drive, you know, our old ski lift, Skyliner Drive, way at the end by Tumalo, um, Tumalo Falls, right before you get to the bridge, you know, quarter mile before the bridge on the left-hand side, on the south side of the street, is basically entrance to mountain biking trails. Right there, if you can, you can use your imagination and look up, that's where a ski lift was. So there was, yeah, it used to be an old ski lift way before there was Mount Bachelor. Um, so that's 1960s, you know, COCC, oldest community college in the state of Oregon, we start building, um, making, you know, building our campus on Aubrey Butte. 1980, uh, basically the mills start to close down, move away, 50,000 people in the population have been. 1998, we hit the, you know, 20 years later, double in population. And then 10 years later, we double again. Think, think about that. That's a lot of strain on a community. Infrastructure, housing, um, growing dynamics, uh, a lot of opportunity, but then some consequences to that as well. So a lot of growth and a lot of change going on. So the story of urbanization, industrialization, if we go back in time, you can sort of, the idea is understand the past, understand some of the things that are going on in the present. Sometimes understanding the past is very informative because it gives us a different vehicle or a different way of observing yeah, issues that are going on, not only in the past, but in the present. I'm gonna share with you a couple different videos uh, as we are becoming urbanized or uh, industrialized in the 1800s. I'm gonna start share with you uh, two different videos to start off. Um, one of them is about the uh, fire that happened at the Triangle Shirtwaist the Factory. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Um, and so you just trying to put your, put you in perspective, urbanization, industrialization, uh, a lot of it was unregulated, uh, before government became involved in terms of regulating industry. And the reason government became more and more involved was in part because the organization of labor unions to be able to say, look, these conditions are not, they're, they're, they are, they need to change. They're, they're alienating, dehumanizing, and actually is, you know, health risk, safety risk, and all those different kinds of things. So I think we take that for granted today, you know, that some of the ways in that working conditions are set up are based on a history of exploitation and response to that exploitation of getting organized to address some of the abuses of power that were coming from, you know, from the industrial sector itself. Um, so here's just a little bit of an overview of the triangle, um, the event at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory man-made disaster, a tragedy of the industrial age, made all the worse because it could have been prevented. Let me set the scene. New York City, early 20th century. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory occupied several floors of a Manhattan business building called the Ash Building. It was located just off Washington Square Park, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the city. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was, by almost any definition, a sweatshop. It was a densely packed place, some 500 people worked there, and the work schedule was punishing. 11 to 12 hours a day, every day. Most of the people employed at the factory were young immigrant women, teenagers even, who didn't speak English. These women sat at long tables, day in, day out, sewing shirtwaists. Shirtwaists were mass-produced blouses. They resembled men's shirts and were very popular with working women. So here's what happened. March 25th, 1911, Saturday evening, the end of the work day, the work week. A fire started in a bin of cotton scraps, perhaps from a cigarette butt. A manager tried to use a hose to put it out, but the hose valve was rusted shut and the hose itself was rotted away. The factory floor didn't have a sprinkler system, so the fire spread quickly. People panicked. The building had only one flimsy fire escape, 
and it wasn't nearly big enough. It collapsed. The building had four elevators, but only one was working, and it only held 12 people at a time. It managed to make four rescue trips before it broke down. Some desperate workers jumped to their deaths down the elevator shaft. Workers tried to take the stairs, but the exit doors only opened inward, and they were kept locked by factory management. Many people were crushed to death trying to get out. Firefighting technology hadn't caught up to the new tall buildings of a city like New York. The fire hoses and ladders could only reach the seventh floor, one floor short of the fire. Dozens of desperate workers jumped out of the windows. They chose to die from the fall instead of the flames. Other workers burned to death or died from smoke inhalation. The whole episode lasted just 18 minutes. 144 people were dead. Two more died later in the hospital, bringing the death toll to 146. Until the events of September 11th, it was the deadliest workplace disaster in New York City history. Days later, on April 5th, a massive funeral protest march took place on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. More than 350,000 people were in attendance. The factory owners, Max Blanc and Isaac Harris, were indicted for manslaughter, but were declared not guilty in their trial later that year. Yet, long after the flames died out, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire served as a cautionary tale that helped to redefine the American industrial workplace. The fire was a key moment in the growth of labor unions, particularly the ILGWU, or International Ladies Garment Workers Union. New York City passed measures including the Sullivan Hoey Fire Prevention Law, which required sprinkler systems to be installed in all factories. It served as a model for state and national workplace safety codes. These measures made American workers safer, but they were too late for the workers who perished one terrible March day at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. All right, let me kind of get, there we go. Getting a little. Yeah, so with, with, with that, I mean, I just sort of one example um, I wanted to share there of uh, the Triangle Shirt, Shirtwaist Coast, uh, shirt waste uh, factory fire that part of understanding <clears throat> there we go um yeah i mean these were the challenges right the challenges that were being faced in this sort of new environment uh, mass industrialization um we had not been regulated the government had not been regulating industry in the ways that it would i mean it took all these different events that that happened uh to start putting pressure on on institutions in order to protect workers, uh, create more safe and, and workable living, uh, working conditions. Um, so anyway, there's a, there's a history behind that. I think um, part of understanding that history is, is helping understand even today, thinking about Amazon and unionization of workers at Amazon and Amazon stance on really working hard to prevent uh, worker union organization. Uh, so understanding those contemporary events, you have to go back. Uh, go back in terms of historical development. But I also wanted to kind of illustrate too, is that think about the transformation that's going on in society at that particular point in time in the 1800s. I mean, major shifts that are going on. It's a new world, right? In some ways, what's going on today, it's a brand new world, right? The way that globalization, new technology, social media, I mean, a major transformations that are going on in society itself. And it creates a sort of major ruptures in society potentially of going on. Okay, one more um, video, and then we'll kind of walk through some of the stuff. This is about child labor, um, you know, with that industrialization that was going on 1700s, 1800s, development of factories and commerce, uh, really did a number on you just move from agricultural societies to urban environments, family life changed, the connection of kids to family changed, the role of family is shifting and moving. Um, so anomie is normlessness, rapid caused by rapid social change. So social arrangements that have, that have worked for a long time in agricultural based communities. Now in an industrial society, there's been a major rupture, major change going on. Um, and there's a lot of kids working on these in these factories and working for relatively long hours and brutal working conditions, sometimes uh, causing death or injury uh, within that. And it took a long time for Congress to basically step in and say, look, we got to put an end to this practice. Uh, I mean, 19, late 1930s, um, where it finally developed and became a federal law in terms of regulating industry. And I think these stories are one of that continue on today about what is the role of government in regulating capital. Even if like things like climate change, um, 
I would argue that most of our discussion about climate change, it's about, you know, about what is the, you know, what, how should we regulate industry or should industry be regulated? It's not about climate change. It's about the fear within the industry itself that they're gonna to have to regulate to some capacity. Um, and that's deeply rooted in our cultural values and ideals and practices. It's also about power to you of industry. Um, so this is, a, I think, a pretty interesting video looking at child labor to kind of, kind of go back to that. So I just want to share this video um, with you. And Sadie Pfeiffer was nine years old when this photo was taken, operating heavy machinery that's nearly twice her height in a cotton mill in Lancaster, South Carolina in 1908. She was just one of many children working in mills. Sadie Pfeiffer was nine years old when this photo was taken, operating heavy machinery that's nearly twice her height in a cotton mill in Lancaster, South Carolina in 1908. She was just one of many children working in mills, fields, factories, and mines. And although these kids were spread across the United States working in separate industries, they all had one thing in common. They all met Lewis Hine. At the turn of the 20th century, the United States knew it had a child labor problem. The 1900 federal census revealed that 1.75 million children under the age of 16, more than one in five, were working at this time. The Industrial Revolution had mechanized American and European manufacturing, and a cheap labor force was needed to complete repetitive tasks for hours on end. Children from poor families were targeted for these jobs because they would work for next to nothing and were less likely to strike than adults. State legislatures and the American public knew this was happening on a mass scale, but didn't act until they saw what it actually looked like. Starting in 1908, the newly formed National Child Labor Committee hired a photographer to investigate and report on the industries employing children. That photographer was Louis Wicks Heim, educator, sociologist, and member of the progressive movement, a period in the United States that saw a wave of political activism and social reform. Hein emphasized the potential power of photography as a tool for social reform in a speech he gave in 1909 called Social Photography, How the Camera May Help. He said, the dictum then of the social worker is let there be light. And in this campaign for light, we have the light writer, the photograph. He traveled extensively, gathering information, interviews, and images of working children across the country. He visited coal mines in Pennsylvania, where adolescent breaker boys worked underground for hours, separating impurities from coal. Sardine cutters in Maine. Oyster shuckers in Louisiana, some as young as four years old. Tobacco pickers in Kentucky. Cranberry pickers in Massachusetts. Beet farms in Colorado and young messengers and newsboys in cities all over the country. Many of the photos captured adults nearby, supervising the children as they worked. When Hein wasn't allowed access to the mills and factories, he waited outside and documented the comings and goings of its workers, whose shifts often lasted late into the night. Laborers would pose for portraits and tell Hein a bit about themselves, their wages, and their work conditions. Sometimes they showed their horrific injuries and described what happened, like this boy from Bessemer City, North Carolina, whose hand got crushed in the gears of a cotton spinner. We know that because each photo, numbering over 5,000, includes a detailed caption written by Hein. Hein coined the term photo stories to describe this marriage of images and text. And it's a big part of how the photos humanize the lives of child laborers to an indifferent public. But it's also his photographic technique that makes them feel so personal. Let's use the photos of cotton mill workers like Sadie as an example. First, many of these photos are framed the exact same way, just substituting a different worker. Hein was trying to show that each child's experience was part of a widespread problem, and the repetition in the images signals that. You can really see how intentional the framing is when you look at how the image of Sadie appeared when it was first published in a progressive magazine in 1909. It's opposite a nearly identical photo of a different worker, set so that the symmetry of the two images makes the machinery seem to go on and on. The left-hand caption says, spinner, a type of many in the mill. 
Heinz photographs are also shot with a very shallow depth of field, which basically means a narrow part of the photo is in focus and the rest is blurred out. A photo with a deep depth of field would look like this one by Jacob Rees, who was photographing New York City slums around the same time. Notice how the playground in the background is in focus, just like the kids in the foreground. Now look at Heinz portraits. In this one, the factory this boy works at looms behind him, but it's almost totally blurred out. This was a recurring visual theme, to include the machinery or the workplace in the frame, but obscure it, favoring the worker instead. This narrow point of focus, combined with shooting from a lower angle, the eye level of these children, is why these images are so effective at humanizing their subjects. Photos like the ones from the South Carolina cotton mills changed the public perception of child labor in the United States, ultimately pressuring state legislatures to introduce laws regulating work for those under the age of 18 and sending kids back to school. Lewis Hine went on to photograph the construction of the Empire State Building in New York City, using the same dignifying techniques he photographed child laborers with, considering the perspective of his subjects, with a narrow focus, emphasizing the worker, not the machinery. Hein was one of the first to use a camera as a tool for social documentary, to shine a light on the mostly unseen. He understood early on the power images have to tell stories. As he said in that 1909 speech, take the photograph of a tiny spinner in a Carolina cotton mill, with a picture thus sympathetically interpreted what a lever we have for the social uplift. Okay, yeah, so um, I think a couple things to extract from that. One is just, you know, that time period, right? Just kind of go back, back that space, industrialization, urbanization, kind of the challenges that were going on, industry relatively unregulated, um, you know, changes in family structure that were going on, kids being in these sort of urban communities and settings, um, kind of, the, you know, the sort of now we're in sort of this labor, kind of the work that we do is different. Um, yeah, all that kind of stuff. The other part of that too is how, how do we become aware of, of, of uh, our community, things that are going on in our community. Um, and that's sort of the power of documenting in terms of Lewis Hines work, that uh, the more that the public became aware, um, the more the public can be in a better position to, um, to respond. Right, and I, I would say, you know, you could look at civil rights movement, 1950s, 1960s. Uh, a lot of that, the, the photojournalism that was going on that time period brought the struggle of blacks in the South to mid, mid America, to white America outside of the South. And it was that journalistic kind of the, the, the work of journalism, uh, photo imagery that allowed uh, groups of people and people to be humanized uh, to be, for people to become aware of what the struggle was about um, and to be involved for some element of social change. So the more that we are aware, um, the more we can um, be in a, in a better place in a better position to be em empowered and empower our community and to be more involved in ways that may be more uh, constructive. A couple different examples. Um, I'm not going to share both these, either one of these videos. If you want to open them up, you can open them up, go to the PowerPoint video. Uh, but the first one is think again, major transformation, what's going on uh, in this sort of industrialized environment. The, in a lot of cities, there were a growing social problem of kids uh, who were abandoned by family members uh, who were living on streets. What do you do with these kids? <clears throat> There's a program started by Charles Lorraine Brace called the Children's Aid Society. Uh, and basically the idea is to put kids on a train um, and ship them out to rural America to, to work on farms, to be part of a family on farms uh, in middle America. This is the start of our foster care system uh, going back to this, these orphan trains. Some kids had good experiences, but you can imagine some kids, you know, farmers were looking for laborers. Um, and there could have been not, it didn't always go so well, uh, but that was sort of like this, this program, this response of dealing with this particular social problem. Jane Adams, I encourage you to watch that video or look at YouTube and just look at some of her work. Jane Al Adams and Ellen Gates Starr did a lot of amazing work in Chicago. This is the Whole House, H-U-L-L, 
kind of spelled out right there. Uh, in Chicago, uh, it's part of what's called the settlement house movement that started in England. And the idea was to become basically a community center uh, for people who are, um, for most, for a lot of immigrants, people who are disenfranchised in, the, in their communities, uh, place of support and community activism, community engagement, community development, community involvement. Uh, so I'll give you one example of the power of the whole house and their, their, their sociological view on uh, the relationship between individual and society. Okay, so imagine a lot of immigrants coming from Eastern European countries, different places that were, you know, people were stigmatized, marginalized, uh, viewed as sort of being the other, right? And um, in some communities, the, the living conditions, the sanitation conditions were deplorable. Uh, it, created, it created an environment where certain health conditions became an issue, tuberculosis. Uh, other health problems started to develop. Um, those in the middle class that, that were removed from these communities started to see, well, that's because they're, uh, you know, they're from these other places. It's because of bad moral behavior of who they are and all this kind of stuff, right? I mean, it was, you know, that became sort of the view. And uh, Jane Addams is like, the issue isn't because these bad people are, have bad morals or values or they're sort of this sort of this racially other sort of thing. It was because of the sanitation conditions and we need to provide better sanitation in our communities, clean up trash in the streets and do better work from the city level of creating sanitary um, community, you know, more healthy um, and more sanitary living environments and street environments. And that impacted the rates of diseases. So it's looking at things from not an individual bad behavior kind of thing or this projection of what's going on to individuals, but rather looking at kind of the social cultural environment of what's going on. The other part of Jane Addams, and there's a lot of stuff that, 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 um, that they did in terms of settlement house movement. One of them I always thought was a really cool thing is that it's right next to the University of Chicago and part of uh, the mission of the settlement house movement was to involve the middle class, upper middle class in these organizations so that students would come and work at the whole house. And in doing that, they have direct contact with people that are living in their community. And when you have, you know people's stories, you're less likely to marginalize and demonize, you're better to understand. So it's, it's bridging that gap, being involved in the community uh, for the upper middle class to be involved in the community because these are the decision makers, right? So the more the decision makers are involved in the everyday life of people, they can be more sensitive, more aware uh, and recognize the struggles that are going on within those communities themselves. So that's a little bit about the whole house, uh, amazing program. Jane Addams was the first female recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and so anyway, just for another tidbit. A uh, little short video on the National Park Service, its history. Uh, National Park is an amazing American thing. Uh, it's very unique to America, uh, but I point this as sort of an example of the National Park Service or any of these institutions that we've covered. Is things don't, they, they don't happen by happen chance, right? Labor laws, it didn't happen by happen chance. Um, we understand, if we can understand the past, we can understand the present. Um, we can think about things like why, how does the world operate the way that it does? What's our role in that? Part of that's about civic responsibility. Uh, what is the responsibility of us as being a, you know, a citizen of this nation, of this global community? What's our responsibility? Self-empowerment to become more self-empowered and to empower communities to do the work that they need to do. Um, if we don't work to understand something, um, I think we're prone to our biases. We're prone to just repeating the past, which may not be, which may be problematic in a lot of ways. Um, I would argue that, or a perspective I'm thinking about more and more about is the role of civic instruction, civics education. Um, it used to be a more of a core part of our educational system and it's gone, it's become smaller and smaller, less likely to happen. Um, and civic, think about how to hold a nation of 360 million people together. Um, we see a lot of polit political division in the world today. How do we sort of work with that? I think, you know, civic, civic engagement, um, classes and civics, what is the responsibility of us? Uh, how do we be mindful of, of our community? All these different things that can come from that. So anyway, something to think about. Sociology defined basically the systematic study of society itself. We're looking at the, the relationship between individuals and society. 
looking at context, historical context, cultural, economic context, basically trying to understand that relationship between individuals and society. And if we understand that relationship, then we can be better involved, more informed, and in trying to figure out how to address social problems and social issues. If we look at our prison system as an example, we incarcerate more than anyone else, any other country in the industrialized world. Uh, to me, it's like this begs the question of like, why, how did we get to this particular place? How does this link up to, uh, to our history of race relations? Um, how does it hick up to and link up to social class issues and dynamics, our cultural values? Um, there's a lot of things that we sort of have to work with and sort of understand why it is that we lead the world in terms of uh, incarceration. I encourage you to watch this video. I'm not going to share this video with you now, but just, you know, maybe just the first 12 minutes, if you want to watch this video on Eastern State Penitentiary. This is the first modern day penitentiary in, in, the, in, uh, in the United States and one of the first in the world. Um, people, have been in cars people have been put in holding cells or been put in dungeons before. I mean, that's nothing new, but the, building a facility specifically for uh, doing penance, so there's a religious kind of focus here with penitentiary, it's doing penance for one's sins. The idea was basically it's solitary confinement, which, which eventually people said, this is a problem. You know, this creates a lot of problems in and of itself. But Eastern Senate State Penitentiary in Philadelphia is the first of its kind. People from all around the world would come, dignitaries, leaders of, of different nations to, to see the Eastern State Penitentiary, how it operated, because they wanted to replicate the model in their own nation that was becoming more modern as well. Um, yeah, watch that video. Uh, I think it's a really interesting video. This is a picture of before penitentiaries of what things look like in England. Um, this kind of gives you a picture of kind of like some things to think about, a lot of things to think about in terms of how we deal with people who've committed certain levels of crime. If we want to understand the, you know, the prison system, understanding our approach to the prison system, I think we have to deal with a lot of different things, right? We have to deal with our cultural values, institutions, uh, power, race, gender, class, all kinds of different things are, are part of that. Um, our approach um, is less about rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is part of our approach, but we are a lot about retribution. Um, uh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, as well as malign neglect. Malign meaning bad, neglect. like out of sight, out of mind, um, you know, it's like, just like, I don't care, um, that kind of thing. Well, why is that, right? I mean, it's kind of interesting in different places around the world. I mean, prisons operate in different ways. We're not the worst in terms of how our prisons operate, but clearly there are better models in terms of models of rehabilitation. Um, so why we do, do not engage in that is a long history of Cult, there's a long history to that. There's culture that kind of intervenes with that. There's race relations. I mean, the more we understand that stuff, the more we can better understand uh, the way that we approach our criminal justice system today and the issues that come up with that. Um, you know, cost forty to eighty thousand dollars a year to incarcerate someone, state, federal level, and it depends on health conditions and different kind of factors. That's a lot of money, right? So the more that we are involved and engaged in understanding these social issues, the more we can be uh, vocal in terms of either supporting or not supporting, right? But if we are not involved and engaged, the system is going to move, and it gives a lot of power uh, to other to politicians, groups, and organizations. So the more informed we are, the more that we're in a position that we can, we can be informed, educated, and help to be involved in, in structuring society in ways that are more uh, conducive to um, stability and other things. I mean, long history in the United States of, of prisons being used as political capital among politicians. Um, and that, man, went 1980s, 1990s. I mean, Democrats and Republicans both, but Democrats, man, really pushed the needle on the war on drugs. I mean, there's political capital that was gained in that. Um, oftentimes, crime stuff is a scapegoat for larger problems, you know? Like, you know, it's like we're ignoring the reality of economic and other social inequalities, and we say, oh, let's just get tough on crime, but we're not dealing with the underlying problems themselves. So issues of privatization, very American, privatizing, you know, prisons, which is an odd thing. Uh, at least for me, it's odd, this idea of profit um, as being a marker of prison management um, and other issues uh, that are going on. Part of sociology is looking at the individual, the relationship between individual and social forces, okay? So looking at the influence of different things like history and culture, et cetera, on the, the, our human experience. There's different ways of understanding that relationship. One is like common sense. Well, it just makes sense. I mean, males are just better at math. Man, that's like that's that common sense is flawed. Uh, sometimes our common sense may be a closer closer link to reality. 
sometimes our common sense is so far off, right? But we're just pulling in um, attitudes and ideas that are coming from culture or our social environment. It makes common sense, but it's not true, right? So common sense has a lot of limitations. Um, rational critical thinking, uh, part of, you know, just developing that skill to be critical thinking of wondering, evaluating, developing ways of thinking about complex social issues involves a lot of critical thinking. Empirical is the objective ways of knowing science, developing measurable ways of knowing. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, an important part of, of the social sciences are both that critical thinking. How do we think about um, the human experience? How do we approach it from a rational thought? And then sort of the objective data, the empirical side. Um, you know, this idea about common sense. Oh yeah, if you're soft on criminals, we have a big, well, that's why we have a big crime problem. We need to get tougher on crime. And there's a lot of illogic to that. That's what makes common sense for, to some people, but it's not empirical, it's not established and it's not even good rational critical thinking skills that are involved in that. Um, so the more that we understand, the more that we can be in a better position to create systems that are more humanizing and beneficial to not only individuals in those institutions, but to society at large. Sometimes academia gets criticized and there's good criticism of academia. I mean, every system, right? Education, law enforcement, healthcare. I mean, every system has its own issues, right? Part of it's good to critique academia, but sometimes, um, especially coming from particular political positions, this idea that the liberalizing of, of students today and liberal campuses. And, you know, part of that, I think, is well beyond a valid critique. It's about delegitimizing the investigation of these social issues, because if you investigate them and want to understand them, it means you have to change them in some ways, or at least it makes it easier to change. And there are people who are certain interests are served by protecting the system, uh, ultimately. We got, I could go back to thinking about um, smoking in the 19, you know, it was common, right? 1940s, 1950s. Uh, smoking is a very American thing. Uh, you know, a lot of health consequences. Scientists were starting to identify the health consequences with smoking. Um, 1960s, 1970s, the uh, tobacco industry gets organized. They realize the science is, is, is indicating all these different health impacts. Or uh, the industry, uh, tobacco industry, is worried about being regulated by the government. And so they create a campaign and a very orchestrated effort to undermine the science. This goes on today with climate change too. Um, climate change and people who poke on the climate change science, uh, their interest is in protecting industry. Uh, they, their interest isn't about advancing science um, and understanding sort of science, but rather about delegitimizing the science itself uh, at least trying to, to say this science and po point, get a cloud over it in some ways in order to protect and preserve kind of uh, particular interests. Um, I'm just gonna provide another example. There's a relationship between teenage pregnancy and income inequality. Uh, the more inequality there is, there's a rise in teenage pregnancy. It's correlational data. So this, is, this is not cause and effect, but there is a relationship between the two. Um, and so good in some ways, a way to address teenage pregnancy is to address our income inequality. Um, that's rarely talked about. Well, why? Why isn't that talked about as a particular approach to dealing with particular social issues? Mass shootings is another, another example. The common sense is that, well, people who commit a mass shooting, well, they must be mentally ill, they're bad individuals, sick or some sort of way, or gun regulations won't work. Um, those are maybe a person's convictions, right? Their values, but empirical and critical thinking may be opposed to those kind of ideas. So our idea is to be more objective, to be more apolitical, remove my own particular position and try to understand it more systematically. Um, and that's gonna make some people uncomfortable um, for sure. Um, it doesn't make it wrong uh, if it makes people uncomfortable. It forces us to out of our own sort of box of thinking and forces into a place to be more, to depersonalize it be more analytical, more objective, try to understand things from a different viewpoint. So an example of why this idea of that mental illness is just fundamentally flawed, and it's flawed for a lot of reasons that people or the mass shooters are mentally ill, is he doesn't explain, okay, well, all of a sudden the number of mass shootings in the United States, why did it change so dramatically? Um, mental health of a nation doesn't change that fast. So what's going on in the social cultural environment that's drawing our attention? Part of it, is maybe we have to get in, engaged in a discussion about masculinity in America and our culture, our cultural violence that we promote. Um, I think that that's gotta be part of that. 
there's these different explanations that social psychology kind of get into um, this, this idea of the masculinity threat of what's going on. And then, I mean, people may want to discount that, but it doesn't mean it's necessary. doesn't mean it's wrong in terms of its analysis or its evidence and proof. So empirical objective, that's sort of what we're after. If you're in the remote class, we'll talk about this in class just to provide an example, but I want to move on now to one of the last points, and that's this relationship between the individual and society. And think about these three philosophical positions. Um, and the one end is free will. It's the individual is fully autonomous without any influence of society itself or environment, right? Person makes a decision regardless of the influence of the environment. It's their, it's their they have total free will to do what they want. Um, determinism, there's different kinds of determinism. We'll call it, kind of call it here structural determinism that the environment that you're in determines your outcome. So on the free will side, if you're born, regardless of what class position you're born into, what class position you end up in is a totally, it's your choice, right? So it doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, middle class, where you end up is total free will. It means it's your choice. Determinism is if you're born, the class position you're born into, you're gonna be staying there. So if you're born poor, you're gonna stay poor. If you're born rich, you're gonna be rich. That society or structure determines your reality. And maybe I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but that's kind of the idea. And the, the idea of self-determinism is that it's individuals within context. Individuals are shaped by context, influenced by context. The choices that we have available to us are influenced by our status, our position, um, our gender position, race, class, all these different things matter. The physical environment, the structural environment that we live in shapes the choices that are available to us, the consequences if we make certain choices versus others, um, they're powerful shapers. So we are self-determined. Um, individuals within context making choices, different choices for different people, different consequences for choices, that's self-determination. So it's looking at individuals within context, right? Here's the individual and then here's all the different rings of influence. So it's paying attention to the, all those different rings of influence. The egg here is looking at self-determination, the size of the egg yolk versus the egg white. Maybe it changes based on context. And, you know, may, how big is the egg yolk versus the egg white shifts based on your race, uh, your race or your class, your gender, different parts of who we are. Um, so the United States tends to be very free will in thinking. This is, you know, a challenge. Uh, we get into this very individualistic thought. We see things from that individualistic perspective. We have a hard time seeing structure. Um, and this is fits common sense for us, but it's not empirically supported. The degree to which we view sort of the individual rags to riches, individual triumph over adversity, all that kind of stuff is we fail to remember that we're there's self-determination. It's about the context too. So I encourage us and we'll encourage throughout this course, it's about looking at the context, um, less than looking at the individual, you know, kind of thing, but looking at social structure context and the influence of those outside forces. A couple of different examples of maybe how, you know, free will does just, you know, there's limitations, right? Um, Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female Supreme Court justice, 1980s. Um, well, why is it? Why it took that long to get the first female Supreme Court justice? We still haven't not had a female president yet in the United States. Uh, well, why is that? Um, you know, that's not about free will. There's something going on within culture and structure that's shaping that. John F. Kennedy, the first non-Protestant president, he's Catholic, and there's a huge sort of disruption that he was the first, you know, that he was Catholic, that he wasn't Protestant. I wonder how long it'll be that we'll have the first non-Christian president. Um, I mean, there's a lot of social forces that are going on there. Uh, to be a flight attendant, uh, to be a stewardess, a hostess uh, during the 1950s, 1960s, regulations or employment conditions, how to be single, attractive. I mean, all kinds of different things like, whoa, man, what's going on there? Um, that was, you know, <laughs> who could be a, a flight attendant was being shaped, right? Shaped by conditions and employment. Um, to be an ice climber, a uh, rock climber, class issues, race issues going on there. Uh, not that it excludes anyone, right? But so if we're looking at patterns of behavior, it's like, okay, why is this, uh, you know, why is there a 
propensity or of a certain race or class to belong to be doing certain activities. Well, there's, there's influences, right? So it just becomes it helps us become more mindful, aware of what those influences are. Here's one metaphor that kind of create kind of works and sort of thinking about uh, the patterns in general, in particular, our cultural values and how they shape kind of this interaction between humans and society. Um, the fish, this fish is jumping from one tank to another, right? Well, if that fish made it, then every other fish can make it. That's very American free will kind of thinking, right? Um, but it misses the interdependent nature of individuals and society itself, you know? Did that fish make it because there are, uh, um, I don't even want to go to like they're biologically different. I mean, that's just a scary place to go. But the sort of idea that uh, did it work harder than others, you know, well, what's, what, what does that mean even working hard? Like what's going on? How do we explain that, right? Well, I'd say, well, there's, we got to look at the structure and we got to look at the context. Are there different bowls for different fishes? Um, do fi different fish get fed in different ways? Um, are there different peers and different social groups that are in operation that are shaping sort of the experience? What is the meaning that we give if a fish does jump out and go to the other bowl? How do we assign meaning to that? What is the meaning that we assign as a culture to that? What is the proximity of one bowl to the next bowl? Is, it, is the proximity different for different fish? I mean, all these different kinds of things, right? So it's about trying to understand more completely the interac interaction between the individual and the context. And we tend to, in American culture, it's the individuals where our focus is, and we got to break that habit and go, man, it's the individual in context. So let's think about the context. Um, if the one makes it out, sometimes they become a token and reinforces the belief that, oh, look, that one fish made it out, therefore everybody else can make it out to you. And if they don't make it out, it's a problem of the, of the other fish. You know, it's, it's their lack of will to get out. Um, and that's misunderstanding human behavior. Um, so it's, it's working against that. And if you're in the remote class, we'll talk about that as an example. Um, and then finally, is what you do with sociology. So if you're interested in sociology or some of these areas of social science, um, there's different ways of different degrees to pursue. One of them could be human development, counseling, social work, other areas related to that, uh, going into those particular disciplines, going to criminology, behavioral science kind of stuff. One of them I wanna point out that's, that students, that I think is a really cool area of education and well as future employment, that a lot of students have, they have a desire to be involved and engaged in their community in ways that are helping communities grow in more positive ways. Um, public policy, um, public sociology is a branch of sociology uh, and there are public sociology programs, but probably more likely public policy programs. Um, Oregon State has one. Most universities have a public policy program. It's a cool area involved in policy level um, decision-making state level, federal level that are shaping communities. And there's all kinds of different levels of involvement, different, different from community agriculture to looking at specifically, you know, looking at anti-poverty mechanisms or programs or policy level decision-making, uh, homelessness. I mean, you name it. Um, there's organizations that are behind doing the work in terms of dealing with these particular, addressing these particular social issues. So I just want to provide that for you. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, there are places to go. There are great opportunities in terms of education and occupations that, that you don't necessarily know because you may not know of anyone who works in these fields. Um, so if you have questions about any of that stuff, let me know. Have a great day. Uh, welcome to sociology. Uh, be well and catch you next time.